One, one of the advantages of, of beauty is, I, I, I mean, each, each of the transcendental properties of being reveal facets of reality to us that we would otherwise be unaware of were it not for them. And, and, and beauty, I, I think, is in many respects the most inviting of the transcendental properties by means of which I, I mean that I, a, um, a work of art or um, whether that's a, a work of plastic art or, or let's say a dramatic piece or even an athletic event like a, a soccer game, you know, a World Cup soccer game. There's beauty in, in the game. There's order to it. There's a kind of, of play involved that enables us to reflect upon reality in a way we wouldn't have. And so what, what attracts us to soccer is, is the beauty of it, I would say. So, um, and, and that, yeah, it's, it's, part, it's, it's there in the, in the actuality of the game. Yes, it's there in the unity of the game, the rules, the norms of the game, the, the different parts ordered in a, in a certain way, but, but beauty is more than this, the sum of those components. And um, I don't hesitate to include it as a transcendental property. As acutely as Aquinas is examining the, the inner workings of our effective life, um, there are things that are passed over that von Hildebrand puts his finger on. And it's because of the, the, the kind of, of habit of looking at what's given that he's, he's embraced and made his own. So that's not so much a different doctrine, okay? And, and I don't think it's necessarily in in the doctrines that you want to look at the differences in different kinds of approaches, but, but um, rather uh, a kind of, of methodology that can open windows on reality that you might otherwise pass by. You might even notice that they're there, but they might not be opened. Okay? Um, and so von Hildebrand opens some of those windows and invites us, teaches us how to open some more, as do some other phenomenologists. So that's, that's one of the ways that, that I, I look at this. Um, and um, there's also, you know, to pull, I mean, you asked a question not just about von Hildebrand, but also phenomenology in general. So I've learned a lot from Monsignor Robert Sokolowski, for instance, who, who already is, is, say, more explicitly embracing the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition than is either Scheler or, or von Hildebrand. And um, he teaches us, amongst other things, to, to find a way to, to get to things as they present themselves to us, right? So in, in his, his introduction to phenomenology, he, he teaches us how, how to um, look through what are oftentimes barriers, right? He, he treats a perception in a way that's phenomenological phenomenologically rich. He's building on, on Husserl, but he's also building on, on Aristotle. And I think he's, he's right to see in Aristotle's, particularly Aristotle's De Anima, a kind of phenomenology of perception where um, the, the outer and the inner become one in a kind of intentional relationship. And that's, that, that too is a kind of habit of mind, a way of looking at things, a way of seeing things that enable us to pay attention to the evidence that if we lead with uh, an epistemology, we tend not to, right? So if, if, we're, if we're constraining the ways in which we can look from the get-go, if we say we'll only accept clear and distinct ideas and everything else is, is out of bounds, or we'll only accept those things that, that have been properly filtered through um, our um, uh, categories of thought or whatever kind of constraint you want to put on, on your ways of seeing. If you, if you do that from the beginning, then you miss all kinds of features of reality. So certainly, Aristotle and Aquinas invite us to, to look and they synthesize, and yet there's, there's certain habitual ways of wanting to systematize, wanting to pull things together that are part and parcel to the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition that, that um, might make one resistant to these other ways of looking. Okay, so. Um, it's in, it's in the practice of philosophy that I, I see the most fruitful kind of e exchange between the two. This, this idea that, that each 
each being is ordered towards its end, yes, but um, it's ordered towards its end in a way that, that also contains the blueprint for the way it's, it's going to unfold itself into, into being, right? And this gets more sophisticated, obviously, when you talk about rational beings. And so in the metaphysics, Aristotle makes the, the distinction in, in Theta II between um, those, those potencies that are rational and the potencies that are, are irrational. The irrational potencies will unfold into their actuality, whereas the rational potencies are always potencies for contraries. Right? So the, the angel um, has a potency to contraries. You can either serve or not serve. Human beings have a potency towards contraries. We can either become virtuous or we become vicious or we become all kinds of things in between. You know, virtue and vice are really paradigm cases for lots of things in between where most of us find ourselves in our, our messy lives. But um, it's the same rational potency that leads us to the development of virtue, um, enables the development towards virtue and enables the development towards vice. The development of vice is itself an actualization then of an underlying potency, um, which is often overlooked in the Aristotelian accounts. And I think it's there that you can talk about the qualitative disvalues of ignobility and, and uh, malice and so forth. They're, they are actualizations of underlying potencies. It's not as though Aristotle has a Pollyannish view of, of the human being where, where we're always making progress towards our actual end. We can embrace an, an end that's contrary to our nature. Um, so you've, you've got layers of potency and act, and at the base of it is this, this value of the, the being as such, and then the, the ob objective value of the being as a human being, and then the, the collection of qualitative values, depending upon how you've, you've actualized your potency for, for contraries, right? And so even, even those evil um, um, habits that we acquire, right, they, they have a kind of, of substance to them insofar as they are actualizations of your, your, your potencies, your capacities. And um, they're, not, uh, they're not merely privations in, in every sense um, because indeed you're, you, you really are vicious, right? you really are kakos in Aristotle's word. And um, an action that, that is evil, not just a character that's evil, but an action that's evil, it's really an action. Right, so an act of murder, where where you've you've um, annihilated another person, you've eliminated their their life. That is itself an evil, um, and from a certain perspective, we could say that it has a kind of existence. Yeah, it's really an action. It's really um, what kind of action? A disordered action, one that ought not to be there. Um, but that that doesn't raise evil itself to a level of of being, right? Um, Aquinas would say. So that's, that's one place upon which the, the um, um, I would argue von Hildebrand is in need of, of some further metaphysical um, aid to, uh, um, to, not, to not think in terms of, of evil as having some kind of being that is the evil as such. Right? Um, that doesn't exist, but rather the, the, uh, the action or the person or what have you. I see Aquinas as Augustinian. I see Aquinas's Aristotelianism as a matter of, of um, um, fitting Aristotle into the Augustinian tradition rather than, than uh, squeezing the Augustinian tradition into Aristotle. Um, and that's a point upon which Thomists have some intramural squabbles, um, sometimes more than squabbles. But the, that, that's my perspective. So I have a very broad um, view of, of Aquinas there, and I see him as embracing Augustine and embracing Dionysus in ways that are not appreciated, right? So third on the list is, is Dionysus in terms of quotations. Um, one, one thing that, that um, 
certainly begins with Augustine and I think is carried through in, in Aquinas. Um, and maybe Aquinas is also in need of some refinement that, that von Hildebrand can provide here is, is the account of the will, right? So you don't, you don't have free choice of the will in Aristotle. Um, you've, you've got choice, you've got deliberative desire, you've got something close to free choice of the will. You don't have free choice of the will. Um, and that's, that, that account of, of free choice, I think, is, is pivotal to the tradition and, and one that, that von Hildebrand um, really is reviving, I think, the Augustinian way of approaching the will there. There's, there's also a treatment of, of the heart that resonates perhaps more with an Augustinian account. Again, I, I, I see this as really thematic in, in Aristotle, that, that kind of delight that we ought to take if we've achieved a greater perfection in doing the right thing because it's right, right? as he says in several places, ta'u, the, 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 the doing it well is a motivator. Um, and um, there's, there's a passage, I, I can't remember where exactly it is, where von Hildebrand describes Aristotle's ethics is, is kind of like a, uh, a man going to a gymnasium, right? You, you work on these, uh, do you remember what, what I'm referring to? Okay. Um, where, where you go and you work out on the equipment, um, and so you perfect yourself, but, but um, what that, that's a sort of self-centered kind of moral exercise. Um, it's, it's got value, you're ready for things, but that's not that's not what the moral life is ultimately all about. And I, I think that's not what Aristotle is really talking about when he's talking about habituating yourselves in the virtues because he's, he's, he's always privileging activity over just habitual, right? So our goal is not to be morally virtuous. That, that's not the Aristotelian goal. Our goal is, is to act uh, in those ways that are characteristic of, of beings who are in possession of a rational principle of soul. Right, so to act well is is indeed to act virtuously, but just to be virtuous and not to act would be to live a life of a vegetable. He says. They they can be more yeah without a doubt more interesting, and it, I think there are several reasons why that's the case. And the most obvious being that we ourselves are are beings who are conflicted, and um, and we we participate in a, a um, you're talking about novels and dramatic performances, uh, television and, and the stage and so forth in particular, and, and it's there that I, I think that we can find ways to identify with, with the narrative that we're constructing of our own lives and, and appreciate that struggle. But in some of the, the greatest novels, I'm thinking of Brothers Karamazov, for instance, um, Alyosha is, is um, pretty consistently good. He is less in interesting than, than Ivan or Dimitri, right? And, and yet he remains as a kind of paradigm case. Now he has his struggles, um, and, and they're, they're struggles prompted in large part by his, his family members, um, but he, he, he consistently chooses a right, and we never see him in a, in a kind of life or death struggle of the sort that Ivan experiences with respect to his atheism, right? And, and so I, I think that great novelists such as Dostoevsky um, utilize both aesthetic dimensions here. Uh, that is to say, there's, there's the paradigm, um, which you can find, for instance, in Gandalf and, and J.R.R. Tolkien and, and Samwise Gamgee in another sense in the same um, uh, novel, Lord of the Rings. They're, they're genuinely good. Frodo's a little bit more conflicted. Sam has his little temptation, but it's, it's short-lived, and then he's back to being faithful Sam. Um, and the, the, um, uh, so the, the, the exemplars are, are laid out at one level, and they're attractive in there as a kind of norm and standard, and that fits with the Aristotelian model. And then, then you have these really interesting, fascinating explorations of the psychological and, and emotional lives of, of characters experiencing great temptation and struggle and so forth. And, 
And in order to make a coherent account of our own lives, I think, I think we, need, we need both. So when we, when we take those, those narratives and, and insert them, um, make them our own and help to make sense of our own lives, we, we look to exemplars in our own life and ways in which we've fallen short or, or, or gotten closer to measuring up. Um, and um, we can reflect upon and appreciate uh, the struggles that we have, the struggles that our, our loved ones have and so forth. So I, I think there's, I guess my general strategy, and there's a lot more detail that I would need to supply here, is, is to say there's room for both lines of analysis, that both accounts of, of the way in which um, beauty and the way it, it affects our interest can have a role in great works of, of art.